Hey everyone. Um, first off, I just wanted to say like I was super surprised by the amount of attention the last couple videos um, got. So I wanted to thank everybody for you know watching the videos, liking them, subscribing, tweeting, or um, following me on Twitter, all that stuff. Um, so I actually recorded those videos like over a month ago, and I specifically recorded them before the auto report came out, um, and that was intentional because. I felt almost like it was cheating if I knew the vulnerabilities before recording the videos because I wanted it to be true to kind of like, I wanted you as if you were sitting behind me over my shoulder while I'm doing the audit. Obviously the audit goes on much longer than, you know, what you're seeing in those videos. I edited it down, but the kind of the key moments, I wanted it to be as if you were sort of standing behind me watching what I was doing. Um, so I, anyway, I mentioned that when I uploaded the video, I tweeted out and said, hey, by the way, one of these vulnerabilities that I claimed I, f I had found in the previous video actually turned out to be safe. And um, I sort of asked people if they wanted me to do this follow-up video where I talk about some of the things that I missed um, as a learning exercise. And it, it got a lot of um, likes and people saying, like, yes, please do that. So that's what this video is. Um, I'll be going through that, that particular vulnerability and explaining why it wasn't a bug. Um, and then there was also another thing I missed um, that, that ended up in the auto report. It was sort of minor. Most of the things I, I've actually found. Um, I, by the way, I didn't mention all the findings in the video, right? I only mentioned the, the high to medium level findings, a bunch of gas savings and informational stuff that I didn't think was important enough to put in the YouTube video. Um, so anyway, those, those two things I'll be going over in this video. Um, enjoy. So the first thing I wanted to do is sort of clarify um, one of the bugs that I thought I'd found in the previous video that turned out not to be a bug. Um, so I talked about this slot ownership variable not being deleted. Um, and the reason why it's important is because that lot ownership mapping is used to determine whether an NFT can be minted or not. The reason why it's safe is you can see this already drawn uh, modifier, which checks that the lock expired time is not equal to zero. Um, if you go go down it further and see, you know, where is this locked expired time actually being set? It's being set in this draw parameter. Um, so they're checking whether it's been locked first. If it's not been locked, and then they're setting it here. Um, and this is the only place this this variable has actually been set. So you're only able to this already drawn modifier is only becomes true after you've done the the draw, which is only after the um, NFT crowd cell has actually been ended. Um, so for that reason, it's it's actually safer. They're kind of freezing the state. Um, once a draw ends up happening and there are no other changes can be done there. So th that ended up being safe. And this is another thing I think you'll find um, when you're auditing is that you might have a particular insight, but it might not be exploitable. And it might not even be that the developer explicitly checked for this thing. Um, they, you just got unlucky and they just got lucky effectively, right? Finding critical vulnerabilities is a combination of skill and also luck, right? This is another reason why I like to write POCs. Um, I kind of broke my own rule in this case. I, I should have written a POC for this, but the protocol is just, there's a lot of moving pieces involved in it. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna have to, you know, set the variable, uh, you know, market is already drawn, make sure that it's, you know, the modifier is getting triggered, uh, set up a batch min, right? So I got a little bit lazy, to be honest. I really should have verified this with code. So the only other thing um, I think worth pointing out that I missed that uh, one of the other auditors caught was there's a very small off by one error um, in this bat batch minting function. And so the batch minting function, it makes a call after all you know, the signatures are verified and everything into this other batch mit, advanced ERC721 batch mit function. And what's interesting, and this is a really subtle bug that they found, is um, this this requires statement here for token ID less than or equal to max token supply. Um, you can actually mint the zeroth token, so you can go over the max total supply um, if a verifier does something like that. But you're kind of I don't know a bit assuming that you're going to have um, a nefarious verifier or something like that, which is you know probably a little bit unlikely. If you like that video and you are interested in learning how to be an auditor yourself, um, I have put together a document of all the resources that I used um, to learn how to become an auditor myself, um, starting with, you know, basic Solidity, learning how, how to code in Solidity, all the way through to some boot camps, capture the flags, and a list of auditing firms that are hiring auditors right now. Um, so a link to that document will be in the description of this video. 
Um, it's only $100. I've seen um, other auditing firms charging upwards of $2,500 for the same content. Um, and since you're coming from my YouTube video, my YouTube channel, I'll be giving you 20% off as well. So enjoy.